<clears throat> Hello from Vienna. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Peter Haider. I will be your moderator for the conference today. I serve as the president of UPF in Austria. I would like to welcome you to this second Europe Middle East online peace talks conference. And our topic today is reflecting on 75 years since World War II towards a vision for global peace and development post COVID-19. As we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, the world may be facing its biggest collective challenge since that time, the coronavirus pandemic. During a recent UN Security Council virtual meeting, reflecting on the lessons learned from World War Two UN and U EU officials suggested that the way we react to the new challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic could be as significant as the way in which the world was rebuilt after the devastation of war, resulting in the formation of such key organizations as the European Union, the United Nations, the Warsaw Pact and the new principle paced world order. Expressing concern that the pandemic is testing the multilateral system and may deepen existing conflicts and generate new geopolitical tensions, they emphasized that the rule-based international order centering on the UN must be strengthened. In the light of these reflections, panelists will express their respective, their perspective on the challenges European nations and Russia face as they emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic and on the role especially parliamentarians can play in this context to promote peace, democracy and mutual prosperity in Europe and in the greater region around Europe. I will introduce now the panelists which we invited for today. First, uh, we have Honorable Erna Hennicott Schöpkes from Luxembourg. Mrs. Schöpkes is the former President of Parliament from Luxembourg. She is co-chair of the International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace in Europe, vice president of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy in Berlin, and a member of the Sunhag Peace Prize Committee. And I just gave a very short version of her uh, bio. Our second speaker will be from Italy, Honorable Pierre Ferdinando Cassini. Mr. Cassini is a senator and former president of the National Assembly in it of Italy. He is the honorary president of the Interparliamentary Union, an organization of which he was president from 2005 to 2008. He is also the chairperson of the Italian group to the Interparliamentary Union for the 18th Parliament of it. Then our next speaker will be Honorable Gazimurat Zerbekovic Omarov. He comes from Russia. He is a member of the State Duma of the Russian Federation. He is a member of the Committee on Security and Anti-Corruption as well as the deputy head of the faction, the Just Russia, a parliamentary political party. Our last speaker on the panel will be Honorable Keith Best. Mr. Best is former member of the Parliament of the United Kingdom. He is the chair of the Board of Trustees of UPF in the UK 
is currently chair of the Weintem Place Charmaine Trust Charity and of Charity 2020, as well as secretary of course, the European Movement and the Parliamentary Outreach Trust. So we have a very excellent panel representing different parts of our uh, of Europe and of Russia. We are very honored also to have uh, Mr. Omarov with us to give us the Russian perspective. I think, as I said in my opening words, this is a challenge and every challenge is also a new chance. And first, I want to invite Mrs. Schöpke. So we go now to Luxembourg and would like to hear the contribution, the words of Mrs. Schöpke. Mrs. Schöpke. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. I think you introduced very well our debate and I will start on uh, the origin of my appointments to the Member of Parliamentarians for Peace. I have participated in a meeting in Albania and one in Morocco. And I must say it was a good learning experience. We have to know better each other in order to build this world of peace we are aiming for. Now, uh, the debate today was uh, put under the celebration of the end of Second World War. I must say, dear colleagues, the 10th of May, 1940, the German soldiers stepped into Luxembourg to occupy the country for five years. This year, the 9th of May, the borders with Germany were closed again. So that was a real shock, the shock by uh, through the Corona crisis. It was a decision by the federal government of Germany and the policemen were controlling again at the frontiers. So that was a very sad memory of the events of the Second World War stepping into the continent 80 years ago. I think this should make us think about the initiatives that have been taken after World War II. Well, if the UN are uh, qualifying it as a peace, uh, yes, you can see it as such. But nevertheless, Robert Schumann, when he started uh, building the EU, the forerunner of the EU was the SICA, the uh, Coal and Steel Union. And it was built as a forerunner after the Second World War in order uh, uh, to um, prevent Germany from rearmament again. So it was a peaceful initiative. And we, we may look at all the initiatives created afterwards in 1949, the Council of Europe, uh, the UN, and the NATO, but I must say NATO, and afterwards the Warsaw Pact, that were defense organizations. So my question is not, they did not prohibit further militarization and huge investments in by their member states in weapons. And now a virus has hit and destabilized the whole world and its economy. And none of the countries was prepared. And this crisis should arise, in my opinion, the question, why continue to invest in the military now? as this is not an answer to the pandemic, and where are the voices claiming for peacekeeping without weapons? That is my first point. When decisions transgressing the borders of nation states are taken, the European Union has shown as a weak construction. In fact, each nation state applied its own rules as health policy is national policy. And so the EU has nothing to do with the health policies 
of the member states, but the virus was mocking our borders. And how were the parliaments involved in the decisions uh, made concerning the virus? A global network for cooperation and early warning within the legislative bodies could be very useful in cooperation with the World Health Organization that had addressed the first warning in January this year. In January, the World Health Organization had warned uh, concerning the virus. But we have to look at it uh, along uh, on behalf of the constitutional law in each member state. Now the virus has shown the weakness of political constructions in democracies. What happened concerning the provision of healthcare material, such as masks and tests, was the showdown of national egocentric behavior. There was a tremendous lack of coordination and the poor financing of health institutions has shown as a serious problem. So parliamentarians should have in this respect to claim for better health care systems in their country. Now on the 11th of March, the virus was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization, but the reactions were low and slow. And so we saw afterwards that solidarity between nations is really necessary. For medical health care materials like masks and tests there were few stocks and no capacities in the EU, so we had to import it from other continents. Isn't this a shame in our economic, so well-doing uh, area? So uh, now parliamentarians should be also involved in the follow-up of the research <laughs> for medicines. And there the scientific background is the only way to inform and educate the public. The scientists working since decades on this virus should have been trusted. In this respect, parliamentarians have to check all the information and help warning before unserious news and promote international cooperation among scientists and the World Health Organization. Well, I sincerely hope that the virus will help our world to become really global. And I think we have to see that without uh, being aware of this global world and with resilience to each other, uh, we cannot uh, further go on to fight the deep diseases of the society. Let us not forget the poverty, the lack of education. And therefore, I think the virus has to uh, be a tremendous chance for new beginning. And it is really, as it was said, it was, it is a bit like the building up after the Second World War. But I think we will do it better this time and not only linked to the military and to some areas as excluding others, nevertheless, after Second World War, what about Russia that has been uh, not honored for all uh, happened there uh, during the Second World War? I thank you for your attention and I hope we have a fruitful debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Schöpkes. Maybe a short question. You you explained uh, that uh, many shortcomings also of the organization facing this pandemic became very visible and uh, we can expect uh, especially uh, economic problems to come but do you see a, a perspective of uh, things which we will learn and which will help us to develop uh, something good for the future, like in area of education or also in international relationships? 
Well, <clears throat> first of all, I, I, uh, what happened in, in the European Union was very shameful. I think there was uh, uh, really uh, the proof that uh, we are not one bloc. We are still nation states. And we have to overcome this thinking to being nation states. And therefore, we need more invest in culture. And we need the culture to understand the other and uh, to overcome these borders. So if the virus can help us and the young generations, because the young generations think uh, differently uh, from those who have uh, uh, lived after uh, the second <coughs> So I think uh, that uh, will be a chance uh, coming, uh, uh, overcoming this uh, border thinking. And therefore the EU must be uh, restructured. Is that an answer to your question? Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> we will hear more questions later. You can send your questions for example, by email to peace talks at europe.upf.org. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to draw your attention that we have translation. You see a button interpretation on the bottom, and there you can choose English, French, and Russian. Our second speaker will be Honorable. Pierre Ferdinando Cassini. He's a senator and former president of the National Assembly of Italy. So we go now to Rome, I suppose. And uh, we have now Mr. Honorable Cassini. Uh, we don't hear you, we don't hear you. Please unmute. Okay, it's okay. Yes, it's now it's okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to participate in this uh, meeting. World War II ended 75 years ago. The policy choice made by the main West European countries, including Italy, united them in a military alliance, NATO, and led them towards the path of European integration. <clears throat> that European and Atlantic policy has ensured our freedom, progress, and democracy. The Second World War gave rise to two opposing blocs around which the system of international relationship was polarized even beyond Europe, throughout the post-war period and until the collapse of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe and the dissolution of the USSR. After the end of the Cold War, we witnessed a wave of progressive democrat democratization <laughs> involving East European countries and large waves of other regions like Latin America, where several countries overcame totalitarian dictatorship and the regimes, some of which admittedly fascist. The fall of the <clears throat> Berlin Wall deluded us that the world was problem-free and that the benefits of globalization, neoliberalism, international cooperation, and scientific progress could avoid new tension and conflicts. In reality, we found ourselves faced with the new challenges, namely international terrorism, which has undermined peace and peaceful coexistence among people since after 9-11, the tragedy of migrants, global warming, economic and financial crisis. This transition confirmed our Atlantic and European policies and the value of multilateralism, <coughs> including our active participation in the United Nations system. Since 1989, however, these policies have been less relevant. 
globalization has brought out new protagonists and challenged the whole balance of power by drawing a scenario marked by increasingly widespread and severe conflicts, instability, terrorism, poverty, and social division. A multipolar, yet not multilateral world. Multilateralism, with all its shortcomings, remains, for me, the only possible approach. Indeed, increasing interdependence and integration crosses not just national, but continental borders, as COVID-19 has shown. This leaves us with no other choice. Today, all these international organizations seem to be weaker. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, many have lashed out at the WHO. The WHO was accused of political partisanship and of not managing the pandemic crisis in a consistently transparent way. Of course, for me, my opinion, some of Mr. Trump's criticism in this regard is acceptable. It is undeniable that delays in communicating the danger, contradictory indication about the rules of conduct to be adopted, and little transparency in the decision-making processes generating a growing and dangerous confusion. But it is in everyone's interest, interest that the WHO be the strong and authoritative medical and scientific voice that it is expected to be. And it is everyone's duty to ensure its autonomy and independence and to revamp its role. The terrible experience of the war gave a boost to European unity. 75 years ago, Schumann marked this monumentum with his historical historical declaration. In recent years, nationalist forces have raged against the EU and also in this occasion complained about its lack of solidarity. But if it is true that Europe was initially disjoined, just think of Miss Lagarde's market disrupting gap in the first few days of the of the crisis, only a few days later, the ECB launched its first funding initiative. More recently, European institutions have done little, almost to the point of forcing the limits imposed on their action as the German Constitutional Court, albeit indirectly, understood. We can argue that more should have been done or will have to be done but no one can say that no help was given. The legitimizing or weakening European institution is not the way to go forward. In conclusion, in the next few decades, the real challenge should be the ability to curb nationalist temptation on both sides of the Atlantic, to curb that longing for division and boundaries after experiencing the sheer force of a virus that is not concerned with national borders. Prosperity will depend on global trade and the movement of people. Nationalism weakens people by depriving them of international institutions to protect them, especially in times of serious difficulty. This and other crises will not be overcome through a came back on the, of the nation state but with the construction of both geopolitical spaces and the sharing of a common destiny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Cassini. Also, I have a, a question for you. Uh, Senator, do you hear me? Yes? Yes, yes. Uh, my question is, what, uh, how, how do you think uh, the European Union has to react also in relationship to Italy 
in order that uh, like the, the, the union is strengthened, even we are faced with this incredible challenge so that we are working more towards uh, an integrative process. What would you expect like as an Italian <coughs> senator and what would be your advice to the European Union? You know that there is always one, uh, one uh, uh, very uh, nice uh, debate about Italy and uh, European institutions, but in any case. Uh, in the beginning of this uh, COVID-19, nobody understood the situation. Uh, we can see now the UK, but we can see uh, much worse the uh, United States and Brazil what happens now. But in any case, I think that after the first moment, the reaction of the European Union existed. I think that Europe exists in this crisis and we don't never forget, we don't forget that also the intervention of a central bank, a European central bank, is indispensable to, to, to balance the situation. Uh, Italy went uh, for Europe uh, other uh, actions, but uh, uh, I, I can say that uh, until now, Europe did enough. I hope that in the future of this crisis, because this crisis, uh, unfortunately, uh, has not finished, uh, we could have other true initiatives pro, uh, by the uh, European institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you for you. Senator. So, our next speaker, and now we leave uh, the uh, not Europe, but more the Western part of Europe. Now we go to Russia. Our next speaker is Honorable Kazimurat Omarov. He is a member of the State Duma. And before I uh, ask him to start his uh, uh, lecture, I would once more inform you we have interpretation because he will speak in English. Uh, he will speak in Russian. And uh, anyway, I give now the word to Mr. Omarov. Спасибо, господин Питер Хедер, за предоставленное мне слово. Как сказать, не совсем Европы. Но э, смею с вами не согласиться, мы э, Европа, э, и Европа мы, э, значит, и Азия одновременно, и можем представлять и другие континенты. Э, мы там, где цивилизация, где мирные инициативы, где прогресс, э, где э, помощь и э, взаимовыручка. Там всегда и Россия. Поэтому, Мария, насчет перевода как? А, переводят, да? То есть я могу не слышать. В этом году мы празднуем 75-летие окончания Второй мировой войны. Вспоминая те годы, мы осознаем, что общие мировые потери по разным оценкам составили тогда более 50 миллионов жизней. Ну и, пользуясь случаем, хочу напомнить своим коллегам, что из них почти половина – это граждане, представители всех народов Советского Союза, которые отдали свои жизни в борьбе с фашизмом. И гражданское население. Вот уже несколько поколений, рожденных после Второй мировой войны, обращаются именно к тому времени, 
чтобы извлечь уроки и не повторить ошибки. Сегодня, как человечество сталкивается с новыми глобальными вызовами и угрозами, мы должны в полной мере использовать бесценный опыт международного сотрудничества и истинного союзничества, накопленный нашими странами в годы Второй мировой войны. Тогда, несмотря на политические расхождения и разные порой диаметрально противоположные взгляды на происходящие события, руководители Советского Союза, Великобритании, Соединенных Штатов Америки смогли правильно расставить приоритеты, лидерам Большой Тройки удалось подняться над личными амбициями и по ключевым вопросам прийти к взаимному согласию выработать общие подходы к сложным проблемам в интересах окончания Второй мировой войны. Установление глобальной системы безопасности, основанной на коллективных действиях и уставе ООН. Позвольте мне привести слова генерального секретаря ООН Антонио Гутераши. Победа над фашизмом и тиранией в мае 1945 года ознаменовала начало новой эры. Осознание особой важности международной солидарности и наших общечеловеческих ценностей привело к созданию Организации Объединенных Наций, главной задачей которой является избавление грядущих поколений от бедствий войны. Однако сегодня мы столкнулись с другим мировым кризисом, который уже унес почти 350 тысяч жизней по всему миру. Сейчас часто сравнивают ситуацию времени Второй мировой войны с сегодняшним кризисом. Наверное, еще слишком рано говорить об установлении нового мирового порядка, Поскольку этот кризис, несмотря на все несчастья, которые он принес человечеству, не настолько разрушителен, чтобы после него можно было построить новый порядок на руинах старого. Однако с точки зрения требования самопожертвования, взаимного сотрудничества, способности подняться выше личных амбиций и интересов во имя преодоления кризиса, эти два периода Возможно, очень похоже. Несомненно, после пандемии именно национальные правительства и государственные институты укрепят свои позиции. В центре внимания окажутся устойчивые экономики, инвестиции в медицину. На международной арене в условиях краха мировых процессов государства Начнут поиски глобального механизма разрешения кризисных ситуаций и ликвидации общих угроз. Однако проблемы глобального масштаба, а они в наше время практически все являются таковыми, не имеют национальных и даже региональных решений. Что требуется в нынешних условиях, так это подлинно широкое международное сотрудничество, не обремененное ни идеологическими предрассудками не историческими обидами. Это означает возросшую ценность базовых норм международного права, международного правопорядка как такового. Необходимость международной координации подтверждается тем, что в настоящее время подобные международные организации или эффективного механизма, действующие на мировом уровне, к сожалению, не существует. В январе этого года президент Путин предложил провести встречу главам государств, которые являются постоянными членами Совета Безопасности ООН. Надеюсь, она, со... она состоится, как и планируется в сентябре этого года, поскольку необходимость ее проведения обусловлена важностью быть сплоченными перед угрозами возникновения шовинизма, расизма, ненависти других проявлений подобного рода. А в свете сегодняшних событий и пандемии, глобальных угроз здоровью людей, Россия сегодня готова и стремится к сотрудничеству, и не раз была готова прийти на помощь странам, которые наиболее сильно столкнулись с пандемией. И наша страна благодарна тем, кто столкнулся 
с пандемией и протянул руку помощи России. Я думаю, саммит стран основательниц ООН продемонстрировал нашу общую верность духу сотрудничества и исторической памяти тем высоким идеалам и ценностям, за которые плечом к плечу сражались наши предки. Еще одна инициатива российского лидера – основать специальный фонд под эгидой МВФ, средства в которые будут поступать из центральных банков различных стран и брать займы, у которого смогут все члены МВФ по нулевой ставке на длительные сроки. При этом президент Путин подчеркнул, что в сложившейся ситуации необходимо предоставлять финансирование странам, наиболее пострадавшим от вспышки COVID-19. Разобщенность перед лицом угроз, обрушившейся странными последствиями, у нас должна быть Должно быть мужество не только прямо сказать об этом, но и сделать все, чтобы защитить и отстоять мир. Ситуация с пандемией коронавируса высветила серьезные проблемы в отношениях между странами, правительства. Пытаясь справиться с кризисом, иногда прибегли к конкуренции и конфликтам. Однако мы также наблюдаем, что за немногими исключениями люди в начале кризиса, оказавшиеся в стрессовой ситуации, вызванной решением правительств обведения карантина, избрали путь мира и взаимопомощи. Доказательством этого явилось чувство сплоченности среди людей, а также благожелательность по отношению друг к другу, которую они проявляют и в Италии, и в Великобритании, и в России, и в других странах, соблюдая при этом изоляционный режим. В разных странах мира мы могли наблюдать Поразительные проявления альтруизма, самопожертвования врачей и медсестер в России, как и во многих других странах, волонтеры выстраивались в очередь, чтобы помочь тем, кто нуждается в этом. Я думаю, странам, правительствам нужно больше брать пример с реакцией обычных людей и стараться проявлять те же качества благожелательности и взаимопомощи по отношению друг к другу. Ведь Бог стремится позаботиться и спасти всех людей, независимо от их материального положения, независимо от их цвета кожи, независимо от страны или политического устройства стран, где они проживают. Ведь человечество – это единственная семья под Богом. Думаю, нам стоит об этом чаще вспомнить и действовать с этих позиций в отношении между странами в том числе. Кризисы должны помогать отстоять в сторону разногласия, сосредотачиваться на общем деле спасения людей. Мы видим, как международное сотрудничество в области медицины заметно укрепилось за время пандемии. Необходимо расширить это сотрудничество и за помощь дальше, делясь информацией о лечении лучших практик, разработке вакцины чтобы ускорить получение результатов. Для этого очень важно наладить обмен информацией. Однако из мер здесь является политика открытых исследовательских данных и возможное получение доступа к ним и использование в кризисной ситуации. Если ранее данный вопрос решался на уровне стран в довольно пассивном режиме, то сейчас экстренно мобилизуются данные исследования в сфере медицины активизируются научные коллабации, работающие над анализом данных, в том числе с применением методов искусственного интеллекта. Усиливается кооперация науки и бизнеса, фармацевтической промышленности по вопросам создания вакцины и аппаратов для тестирования заболевших между университетами и госпиталями в целях оперативного сбора новых данных об особенностях протекания болезни, вызванных COVID-19. Важное значение сегодня приобретают проекты по международной кооперации, научно-технической, инновационной сфере, научному консультированию, использованию открытых исследовательских данных. Думаю, сегодняшняя пандемия учит всех нас тому, как проявлять альтруизм и самопожертвование. Не только среди медицинского персонала, но и на всех уровнях власти, включая парламенты стран. 
В России поддерживают заявление председателя Межпарламентского союза Габриэли Кувейс, барон, к которым она обратилась к генсеку он Антонио Гутершу, объявить всемирные перемирия, остановить все войны и отменить все санкции, которые мешают поставкам медикаментов, питания во все страны, которые страдают от пандемии коронавируса. Считаю, что межпарламентское сотрудничество может сыграть важную положительную роль в развитии понимания между странами. Ведь именно парламентарии представляют тех самых людей, которые проявили самые высокие человеческие качества. Столкнувшись с пандемией, контакты по парламентарской линии должны содействовать преодолению кризиса доверия между государствами. Укрепление межпарламентского сотрудничества – сложная, но посильная задача, стоящая перед нами. В завершение хочу поблагодарить всех участников дискуссии за то, что этим вебинаром мы уже показываем свое желание понять друг друга и построить более доверительные отношения. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Omarov. Uh, I have just one short question. If you would have one wish, what, uh, what would you like that uh, the EU or Britain, EU countries or Britain change? Uh, in uh, what they should improve in their relationship with Russia. Я думаю, что и Та дата, которая сегодня прозвучала не однажды, 75-летие над победой над фашизмом, где практически участвовали представители всего мирового сообщества, смогли объединиться перед этой мировой угрозой, преодолеть ценой большого количества жертв, уже это звучала статистика, я думаю, что и сегодня, когда существует угроза пандемии всему мировому человечеству, нужно как раз понимать, что не нужно себя делить на континенты, на страны. Нужно объединить усилия, проявлять благоразумие и строить новый цивилизованный миропорядок во всем мире и оказывать братскую помощь и другим странам, которые сегодня оказались в тяжелейшей ситуации. Ни для кого не секрет, в каком положении находятся многие африканские страны, где люди практически не имеют даже средств к существованию. Поэтому это все должно объединять. Мы должны объединиться и понимать, что Бог един, всегда добро побеждает над злом и добрые инициативы в Российской Федерации, главой Российской Федерации будут всегда приняты. Россия открыта для диалога, для э, равных э, взаимоотношений с учетом взаимного уважения. Мы открыты и приветствуем любые инициативы, мирные инициативы. Thank you very much. I think this was an important uh, message. Our last speaker now is from Great Britain, Honorable Keith Best, and uh, he will give us uh, surely uh, interesting uh, food for thought, as British people always do. So we go now to London. He's best. Thank you very much, Herr Haider. Uh, in times of global crisis, whether of war, 
financial collapse or pandemic, just as in all the best sci-fi movies and texts, the world usually comes together to find a common solution. That is what happened 75 years ago with the creation of the UN and the Bretton Woods institutions. The latter at the financial level still operating reasonably effectively despite very changed circumstances. The political institutions, however, seem to be caught in a time warp, such as the UN Security Council with its five permanent members holding the veto representing the victorious powers in 1945, with the notable exception of the swap of nationalist Chinese Taiwan for Beijing, and not the rail politique of today. Consequently, other ad hoc groups have formed, such as the G20, originally founded in 1999 to promote international financial stability, but now with a wider remit. The 1960s and 70s saw an outpouring of a global sense of community, especially among the young people, uh, which I was myself in those days. Perhaps in response to the Cold War and the threat of mutually assured destruction as a military policy of survival, but also with world leaders such as Kennedy accepting and advocating that America could not solve global problems on its own. He echoed the wartime leaders call for uniting the nations and world government so that the bloodletting of two major conflagrations could never happen again. Global values were based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, complementing the Geneva Conventions. 75 years has done little to dispel the mythology that surrounds the Second World War. Yes, it is true that Britain stood alone for a time until the American entry into the war following Pearl Harbor and the self-defeating declaration of war by Germany against the USA. The sacrifice of the few and of British civilians in the cities ensured Allied supremacy in the skies. But it is arguable that the West was saved by the disastrous decision for Hitler to invade Russia, certainly no student of the Napoleonic Wars. I can understand why the massive loss of Soviet lives, although the purges accounted for more than did the Nazis, has built into Russian folklore that it was the result of Barbarossa, started in June 1941 before American involvement, Stalingrad and Kursk, which turned the tide. That sense of common endeavor seems very different today. It was encapsulated recently by the respected financial journalist Jeremy Warner in The Telegraph. <clears throat> he said, international cooperation is collapsing just at a time when it is needed most. Loss of trust in two of our most important multilateral institutions, the World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization, is powerfully indicative of this every man for himself approach. Trumpite peak and aggressively pursued Chinese expansionism are in combination threatening to destroy a multilateral system that has delivered rapid growth in economies around the world and lifted hundreds of millions out of poverty. US Ambassador Hill only recently summed it up on one of these seminars by stating that the US is reducing its influence by withdrawing from international institutions and is shooting itself in the foot, which makes it difficult to work, walk forward. It is also a far cry from Churchill's speech in Denmark in 1950 when he spoke of the four main pillars of the world temple of peace being America with all its dependencies, Russia, the British Empire and Commonwealth and a united Europe and stated, and I quote, the creation of an authoritative, all powerful world order is the ultimate aim to which we must strive towards. Now, never let a good crisis go to waste is probably a misquotation of Sir Winston Churchill, but more certainly, he did speak of a United States of Europe and global cooperation. Much later than Churchill's famous speech in Fulton, Missouri, which he called Sinews of Peace, another leader in the same place in May 1992 said, and I quote, on today's agenda is not just a union of democratic states, 
but also a democratically organized world community. An awareness of the need for some kind of global government is gaining ground, one in which all members of the world community would take part. That was Mikhail Gorbachev. The United Nations, beyond the Security Council, which has the ability to issue mandatory resolutions, but unlike during the Ebola, Ebola epidemic, has failed this time to declare the current pandemic a threat to international peace and security, is limited to a mostly advisory role and its stated purpose is to foster cooperation between existing national governments rather than exert authority over them. It can deploy peacekeeping forces, but of course only with the agreement of the participating states. But where is the accountability apart from that to the General Assembly of States? Gordon Brown, our former Prime Minister, has urged world leaders to create a temporary form of global government to tackle the twin medical and economic crises caused by the pandemic. But this will not be the last, and we know already of other threats, such as to the environment through climate change, which need global solutions. He referred to making the G20 a broader organization, including the UN Security Council, because in the current circumstances, you need to listen to the countries that are most affected, the countries that are making a difference and countries where there is the potential for a massive number of people to be affected. I would add, that any organ of global governance needs not only the sort of legitimacy given to the UN by the General Assembly of Member States, but also a democratic accountability through not just states, but representatives of the people. We call uh, that a parliamentary assembly, which could be created now under Article 22 of the Charter and could be based on the model of the original European coal and steel community, which Erna referred to, which of course developed into the current directly elected European Parliament. It would be ideally placed to act as a scrutiny in perhaps a series of select committees to the different organs of the UN. If we are not to allow this crisis to go to waste, we must engender in world leaders and the population as a whole that sense of globalism, which makes us all brothers and sisters keepers, wherever they are, that it is in national as well as humanitarian interests. We must enable our international institutions through evolution rather than revolution to break free from the straitjacket of 75 years ago and reflect the modern world. We must engage and remove the capacity for misunderstanding and consequent devastating error, which characterizes so much modern diplomacy. In conclusion, rather than a disastrous trade war, the emasculation of WTO and a war between oil producing states, we should be embracing in a conference of ideas, the second global economic power of China and the engagement of Russia. The first is a totalitarian state and reflects more common than individual rights, so there is a large gulf between them and the West. The second has an understandable sense of paranoia about the loss of its hegemony over Warsaw Pact states that then join NATO and the EU and the Commonwealth of Independent States, as well as a sense of lack of appreciation and loss of pride at not being recognized as a world power. Yet their interests in an accommodation with the West is as great as the reciprocation. That should start with a discussion of how we can make the UN and its agencies, such as WHO, more effective to deal with global threats and more accountable. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Keith Best. Uh, how, how do you think, uh, international organizations like the UN uh, can be strengthened. Uh, learning from the situation which we experience now during this pandemic uh, and also how Britain 
in this new situation, being uh, not anymore part of the EU, still can contribute to such a development? Well, of course, at the moment, the UK is one of the permanent five members and it is a nuclear state. So it has still a considerable amount of influence uh, in the world uh, affairs. Uh, I hope that will continue because I believe broadly, although not always, we are a force for good. But you ask how can the UN respond to this? Well, I think it has to be, and its agencies have to be given greater power, a greater capacity to bring things together. Uh, Erna already mentioned the WHO and its, its lack of ability to coordinate matters. Well, that clearly has got to change. But if those institutions are going to be given greater powers of enforcement, then of course it has got to be through common consent of member states, but more importantly in a way, it's got to be accountable. So there has to be a body, and you've heard my suggestion that we should see a parliamentary assembly of people's representatives at the UN level, not in an executive way, uh, not, not with powers of legislation, but rather like the European Coal and Steel Community Assembly started as a consultative body, but one that is ideally placed on behalf of the peoples of the world to monitor and to offer suggestions and criticism of the different UN agencies. So, I mean, that, that's my solution to the issues. Thank you very much. So, after our four distinguished speakers, uh, we still have around 20 minutes for uh, discussion and answering questions. So I hand over to Mr. Heiner Hanshin. He collected some of the questions and he will address them now to our speakers. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, hello, uh, honorable panelists and all participants. Um, I have uh, first questions I would like to address in a gentleman's way to the lady here. We're happy to have you, Miss uh, Honorable uh, Miss Schöpkes. Um, this question comes from Vienna. What can be done to counter the erosion of trust between nations? It's, uh, yes, between nations. I, I did not get the, the question. Uh, uh, what can be done to counter, well, to, to, yeah. to turn okay. around this erosion of trust that is happening between the nations? Between the nations. You can see currently in the current world. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I mentioned it as uh, I have now the proof that uh, the European Union was too weak to act really. And uh, as having lived the European Parliament and have got through uh, initiatives concerning, for instance, the pesticides, we had a good text, but it was not applied in the member states. So. The EU can do whatever, uh, together with the Parliament and the Commission and the Council. If in the local uh, nations, the texts are not applicated. So all this work is useless. Mm -hmm. And that's the tragedy. There is much talk, too much talk. We talked about this horrible problem of the nation uh, spoiling by chemicals already 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, we had resolutions and we had regulations. That was a juridical text that should have been applied in the member states, but it was not. In my opinion, there is a real gap between parliaments and governments. And governments are doing just what they want to do for being re-elected. And parliaments are not strong enough to oppose always. Parliaments are also linked to their party and they have to submit to the party chiefs. So the talk is rather biased. And we have to, to have a serious talk about reshuffling 
democracy. Perhaps the system of Switzerland has been sometimes mentioned, but there are certainly better models than what is happening now. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Mrs. Schöpkes. I would like to ask a, a second question that is from, uh, also from Austria. Um, that is connected to this one. Uh, I would like to address it to the Honorable Omarov. <coughs> How and by whom can trust building be promoted and highlighted? Trust building between nations. How and by whom can you see an improvement of the, the situation of distrust between nations? It's a difficult question, I think. Я могу привести, наверное, на примере. Вот, допустим, хочу привести пример 20-летней истории взаимоотношений между Россией и Турецкой Республикой. 20 лет тому назад, можно сказать, не было практически никакого доверия. И я являюсь тогда депутатом Государственной Думы, был э, членом группы дружбы между парламентами России и Турции и как бы наблюдал за этим процессом и координировал. И вот сегодня, можно сказать, прошло 20 лет. Э, анализируя вот момент между двумя странами, я пришел к выводу, что динамика развития отношений между двумя странами в динамике послужил туризм. То есть очень много российских граждан стало выезжать в Турцию. И очень много турецких граждан стало приезжать в Россию на работу, заниматься различного рода бизнесами, в частности строительством. Но самый большой эффект принес туризм, когда люди начали общаться между другими людьми. И, по сути дела, страны породнились за счет туризма, потому что россияне очень много знают про Турцию, выезжают туда, дружат с гражданами из Турции. Турция стала открыта для российских граждан, и поэтому выстроились достаточно... Кто бы сегодня не был во главе Турции или России, отношения между странами разорвать практически, уже, думаю, исторически будет невозможно. Но также хочу привести пример во взаимоотношениях, допустим, с Англией. Тоже исторически были очень всегда теплые взаимоотношения. Еще с, в прошлом веке, с царских времен. Поэтому только интеграция людей, взаимоотношения людей, открытая политика, диалог, взаимоотношения с парламентами будет укреплять отношения. Надо быть открытыми, надо уважать друг друга, надо приглашать друг друга. Я, допустим, в прошлом году визу оформлял, хотел приехать посмотреть музей Шерлок Холмса и Биг Бен. Визу в Англию оформлял полгода. Поэтому при таких взаимоотношениях, соответственно, динамики в развитии не будет. Поэтому нужно быть открытыми для, для друг для друга и быть в диалоге и Сегодня пандемия очередной раз миру показала, что только вместе, только сообща мы можем преодолеть любой кризис, любую ситуацию в мире. Thank you very much, Honorable Omarov. Uh, our next question comes from Russia, and uh, maybe it's good to ask that question to uh, the Honorable Cassini. Do you think that a pandemic after that, this pandemic, uh, we could face like a third or fourth world war through this? Could you, could you hear the question? Do you think that the pandemic, uh, this pandemic, is the beginning of a third or a fourth world war? The situation that is happening through this pandemic, the division, the separation of nations. 
In other words, the fear of world war. Is that... Uh... I, hope, I hope no. I hope uh, the opposite, the vice versa. I hope that this, pand this pandemic uh, shows very well that it's absolutely necessary, the partnership between the states and also the, the rule of multilateralism is strengthened now because uh, without uh, organization uh, uh, that can work about, uh, for example, health, now good health is necessary. And uh, uh, the, the situation, I, I was thinking before uh, when uh, I spoke the, the, the friend, uh, uh, Russian friend, uh, I, I think the, 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 the necessity of uh, the multilateralism to uh, solve the situation, for example, in Mediterranean area, uh, we have uh, a, a new situation in Mediterranean because uh, uh, we have a new assertivity by Russia and by Turkey. And uh, we uh, see this in Libya or uh, in uh, uh, in uh, near Cipro uh, uh, or uh, in uh, Syria uh, and uh, all the situation needs now more multilateralism and more collaboration, more partnership between the states because alone Italy, France, Germany, every state cannot afford this situation. This is clear. Um, uh, we, we could uh, know, uh, think about the research. Uh, we need the research. We need uh, uh, the science because uh, the scientists uh, discovered uh, uh, absolutely are necessary for the future to, to fight against COVID-19. And this is impossible for the, the the only one state alone, without the partnership with others. I think the pandemic uh, can offer us a new opportunity to strengthen our relationship. And the organization, like yours, is very important, too important than in the past now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Cassini. Uh, our next question uh, will be from the Middle East and uh, directed towards the Honorable Keith Best. Uh, so somehow in your personal opinion, will humanity strive after the pan pandemic to unify the world, yeah. unify religions, the society, because after all, we can realize through this pandemic we are all equal before the virus rich or poor big or small black or white yeah what is your opinion about that Th thank you very much it's a, it's an excellent question uh, first of all um if there are any to be any changes at the international level they usually have to be preceded by a public movement and so this is an opportunity, and in my few words I referred to not letting a crisis go to waste. Uh, this is an opportunity where hopefully uh, mobilization of public opinion can say uh, that yes, we are all brothers and sisters, that we do owe a duty of care to people, that it's quite clear that this pandemic is going to and has already impacted most on the poor people, the people who are less prepared in countries, even in a, a sophisticated, uh, wealthy country like the UK. It is the poorer people who are suffering most from this pandemic. They are the ones who are falling sick. Uh, and I dread to think that if we were to get a second wave in countries like India or Africa, the mm. devastation would be beyond contemplation. It would be terrible unless the world is prepared to come together. And I think what is encouraging is when you've got the pharmaceutical companies working together and also with an agreement that once a vaccine is found, 
it will not go to the highest bidder it will be made available to those poor parts of the world or those parts most affected by COVID-19. So that those people will get that where, where they really need it. But at the end of the day, you know, we've got to use this opportunity and it seems sad to call it an opportunity, but it is an opportunity to mobilize public opinion, to get in touch with their parliamentary representatives, both at the national and the transnational level, such as the European Parliament, and to say, look, we want you to make sure that the international institutions, both regionally and at the international level, are better equipped to deal with these issues in the future. Because I think one thing we can all agree on is that this is not going to be the last pandemic. We've had SARS, we've had Ebola, we've now got COVID-19. There will be another one, sadly. And we, will, we must be better prepared to deal with that. And the only way of being better prepared is to have, as uh, the Senator uh, was saying, uh, better multilateralism, but also better uh, ability to deal with these things at the international level. And can I just uh, very briefly echo what uh, Representative Omarov said? Uh, because I agree entirely about building trust is one of the most critical issues. And too often that's looked at just at the political level. But when you think of culture and sport and the way they can be used to build trust, uh, that is an, often an opening which can lead to better political understanding. But I've always been a believer in dialogue, even if you don't like a regime, if you don't like their human rights record, if you don't like what they're doing in the world, that's no reason why not to talk to them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Peter, I don't know how, how the time is. I, I think we have to come to a conclusion of our conference. Thank you, Heiner, for collecting questions. I'm sure there are many more, but unfortunately we cannot uh, answer them now. I want to thank uh, all the panelists for all the effort, especially we were very honored to have a guest from Russia because uh, uh, this is always special to us, especially when we are in Vienna because somehow we have found uh, a good relationship in our heart and our soul with Russia. So, um, and I think it's very important also to build this bridge uh, so that uh, the big Europe, Eurasian continent can really come together and also all the, we have to say the, the Nation, the Christian nations uh, shouldn't be divided. How we can speak about uh, interreligious uh, dialogue? We have first to have the unity uh, on our continent. Anyway, uh, to conclude our conference, I will call now upon uh, Mr. Jacques Marion. He is the president of the, of the UPF Universal Peace Federation in Europe and Middle East. And he wants to uh, give us some ideas, some uh, suggestions of the work of UPF and especially of the uh, International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace. So now we go to Paris. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Distinguished panelists, uh, first, let me warmly thank you for your participation on this panel and thank you for your insightful presentations. Uh, you've made the point that despite their justified concern for their citizen security, nations need to keep in place a strong multilateral system of engagement and that parliamentarians are called upon to maintain this ideal and put it into practice. This is very much the conviction of UPF as well with its ideas of interdependence and mutual prosperity and universal values. Today, we compare the period after the end of World War II with our current situation emerging from this unprecedented health crisis. 
in the shadow of that war, the United Nations of the World War II, the United Nations and the EU were created as peace building organizations. Yet we can see today that although we recognize their immense importance, neither of them truly fulfills the world's expectation for peace, and that is not because of COVID-19. It has to do more with the rise of self-interest at the expense of the common good, whether in the form of nationalism, religious interest, or ethnic exclusivism. When 75 years ago, Robert Schuman, who was quoted by several of you, made his founding speech for what eventually became the European Union, it was based on the conviction that the self-interest of nations would better be fulfilled when they served a greater cause, in that case, the economic community. That principle of peace building is what prompted our founders, Dr. and Mrs. Moon in 2000, to propose the revival of the United Nations through the creation of an interreligious council whereby nations in the UN would be represented not only by political leaders, but also by spiritual leaders or educators representing the great spiritual cultures of the world and whose role would be to remind us all that peace building comes from living for the higher purpose and the common good as taught by all the great religious founders. Senator De Venecia, who was then the speaker of the Philippines parliament, uh, arranged for this proposal to be introduced into the United Nations through his nation's delegation at the UN. In the same way, if we are to rebuild the world after COVID-19, we need institutions that maintain core spiritual values as a foundation for peace. Recently, our founder, Mrs. Moon, said that UPF, together with partnering organizations in the fields of politics, religions, business, or the media, should form what she called the community, one community under God. She was using religious terms, but I do not think she was preaching about religion. She was only emphasizing that today, as many as several of you today pointed to, unless the world comes together centering on the higher principle of living for the common good, we will not overcome the trends towards division, separation, and breakdown. And as we see it, UPF and its affiliated associations, such as IAPP, the Parliamentarians for Peace, or uh, IAPD, the Interreligious Federation for Peace and Development, or others, are ideally placed to encourage leaders to take such a stance. And it actually is, in fact, their task to do so. Three years ago, UPF brought together the three regions of Eurasia, Europe, and the Middle East into one greater region, now composed of 72 nations, a region, a region that stretches from Dublin to Vladivostok, from Reykjavik to Kabul. We all know that we do have serious issues to resolve together, but we also recognize that we have common roots and these allow us to move forward with a spirit of cooperation beyond nations, religions, or political ideologies. I want to thank you again and our distinguished panelists and also all our participants for attending these second peace talks of UPF Europe and the Middle East. And I invite you to close to attend our third peace talks on June 9th, which will be organized by the International Association of Media for Peace with media professionals on the theme, the role of the media during COVID-19 pandemic and the lessons we could learn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacques Marion. This ends our conference. I want to thank once more all our distinguished honorable panelists for uh, let, sharing with us their insightful views from different parts of Europe and from Russia. It was really stimulating to hear all of you. And also I want to thank you, all the, the participants, all who sent their questions, even some might not have been answered. I hope we can forward some questions to some of the speakers. 
So yeah. I wish you a good evening from Vienna and auf Wiedersehen <laughs> at the Thank next you. Peace Talk. Thank you. In two weeks. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. <laughs>